It always takes a second for it to actually pop up. Yes, I think we're Forever. live. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> So hi guys, we are here with Chloe Lees. I'm so excited to have her here and get to talk to her tonight. Um, so I figured we would just go around and introduce ourselves and our channel name and our favorite scene or book of Chloe's. But I think scene, because most of us have the same favorite. So Avery, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'm Ava or Avery. I do not care which one you use. Um, and I'm from Ava's Romance Books. And my favorite is Always Only You. Ren Bergman is literally my ideal man. <laughs> so thank you, Chloe, for writing it. I love him. Um, and then funnily enough, my favorite scene, I had a hard time like picking between two because I love them so much. So the first one is I love the shower chair scene in this book. As someone who uses a shower chair, I loved this. And I can't believe like someone could write a scene about someone sitting in a shower chair to be romantic and hot and everything. Like it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I also love the, um, the pull off to the side of the road, doing your business, but also finding a cat scene. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, your girl also has stomach problems. I have celiac disease, so I felt Rooney in this situation, and it was just not <laughs> close that she ended up finding a cat. So, <laughs> so. that's funny. Um, so I'm Caitlin, the love librarian, and uh, I wish I could say I'm different from Avery, but I'm not. My favorite <laughs> book is Always Only You, and one of my favorite scenes is actually from this book, and it's the scene where Frankie is at Ren's house and she's like freaking out because her period started and she's like making it like this big deal, but he's all like, what do I need to go get you from the store? Like, what do you need? And I just like seeing that <laughs> in a book because like, I just appreciated a guy not treating a period like it was like the weirdest thing in the world. Like it happens, <laughs> it is a womanly feature. And I just, that just solidified everything else that solidified my love for Ren, but that there I was like, oh, Yes, 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 yes. So that's like my favorite, favorite scene. I love that scene too. Like, and actually I have a whole video recommending books that have really great period representation in mm -hmm. it because I feel like it's such a great way for caretaking to take place. But I'm yes. actually going to be different. I mean, I love With You Forever, or I mean, um, Always Only You, but With You Forever is probably my favorite because I've been in love with Axel for so long. <laughs> and when his book finally came, it lived up to every expectation I had of him and him and Rooney together were just so perfect. And I think one of my favorite scenes was kind of, it wasn't a very long scene, but I appreciated it so much was when Rooney had to get an infusion and Axel like goes with her, even though he's afraid of needles. <laughs> it's the cutest <laughs> thing ever. I, it was so sweet and it, it was pretty quick, but I just, something about that just, I, it said so much about his character and I just <laughs> love him so much. <laughs> Um, I'm at Morgan and my favorite book is always only you. Um, but my favorite scene, I'm so bad at remembering details. So I had to pick one of the more recent books, but I would say either the like scene where he's on the couch cause he doesn't feel good. Um, Oliver and Gavin has to come over and help take care of the kid. <laughs> I just, I loved it so much. Um, and we got to see like the caring side of the grumpy Gavin and, um, mm -hmm. but like also how real Oliver had to be with the fact that he like couldn't get up off the couch. Um, but it was still obviously hilarious and I just loved it. Um, and then from with you forever, the tent scene where, um, Axel is trying to do something special for Rooney and sets up the tent and then he hurts his back and she has to massage his back. And, um, I just, I loved it so much. <laughs> There's probably favorite scenes I could pick from every book, but I would say those are mm -hmm. the two that are at the top of my head right now. So my question for you would be, what is your favorite book that you've written, Chloe? Or do you have a favorite scene? It's every book I when I just finished, I'm like, that was my yeah. favorite. <laughs> and I think that's just because it has to become so real to you. Um, these characters just start like... <laughs> I sound sort of weird saying it, but like they just exist in you. And so when you're like sitting down and writing their perspective every day, like I think it's just that feeling of the intensity of the closeness to their motivations, their backstory, their pain, their their hopes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you know, just hearing 
the scenes that you all liked, like every one of those moments, I can remember like the joy and the satisfaction or the laughter or the tears even that I felt like when I wrote it. So I really don't have a favorite. I just, I guess I would say I try when I sit down and write a book for it to be that experience that when I finished, I'm like, that was my favorite. I always want to be like getting deeper, feeling something Mm -hmm. more for it to be a dynamic experience. And I felt that with every book. So hopefully that means I'm doing something right. I feel like that shows too because I feel like I mean always only you definitely has a special place in my heart but with each book I finish from you I'm like she did it again like it's another (laughs) favorite like your entire series so far and I'm sure the next ones will be too are like top favorite books for me so thank you I also want to mention the mistletoe motive because I feel like that one also gets kind of like because it's not a part of the series but like that one was so good too I loved it It thank you I was terrified when um, Michelle Okobo reached out to my agent. She was like, I really like the Bergmans. Would Chloe be interested in writing a holiday book? And I was, all the books are blending together. I was finishing something and starting something else. I can't even tell you what. And I was like, I cannot write the way I write and write a full-time book. So how about a novella? And Michelle was like, okay. So, but then I was like, crap, I've never written a novella before. What did I just do to myself? So I was definitely like overwhelmed by the technical process. Like by the time I started that, I'd written a number of full length novels. So I kind of had like my system and my routine and I was like, oh no, I got to start all over again. Got to write single point of view. So it was um, a challenge. And so I, I'm glad that that people enjoyed it. But yeah, it was so great to work on. Um, like I worked with Izzy, I think Elasha reads. I don't know how she says her handle, but that's her handle on Instagram. She has type one diabetes. So I got to work with her and she's been kind of like a reader friend and we've gone close. And it was just really cool to get to work with someone um, very personally on that and um, to just explore autism in a new way and Gabriella and just let my version of what I like about the holidays, just run with it uh, through Gabby, who's mm-hmm. all about the holidays. So yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you like that. I just, I decided I was just going to have fun and let it, let it be what it was. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I want to mention too, like, cause I really love hyping up books with disability rep. I love it. And I've gotten multiple comments, like telling me like, thank you for recommending the mistletoe motive because I've never, ever, ever heard about a romance with someone with diabetes. Like, so like, thank you. So like people love that rep. So I, I feel like it's just, I know so many people who have T1D and it's like, I, I don't know if it's just because people don't think it's like, it's just very invisible, you know, like a lot of folks just manage it really well. And and that's part of what, you know, like Gabby and Jonathan talk about, right? Is she's like, you know, I know a lot of what you live with, or I, I can relate to that it's, it's hidden and people don't see it and they just think you're fine, but there's so much work, like any chronic condition, there's so much work mm-hmm. and thought and like kind of hidden isolation going on. So yeah, it just felt like a really, he was a really great character to explore that. And because we never get his perspective. So we really had I really wanted to bring a lot to how Gabriella has to do work to notice and show him like she cares so that you kind of had to have that empathic journey through her enough, though, that someone with T1D could read the story and feel like, oh, wow, I felt represented, too, even though I was never in Jonathan's head until the Mm -hmm. epilogue, the spicy ladder epilogue, (laughs) (laughs) which I asked them to put on the cover because... If you haven't read the book, the latter plays the bookstore ladder plays a prominent role in the epilogue, and it's not there otherwise. So I was like, I want to put that as an Easter egg in the cover for my reader. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> that's <is> brilliant. <laughs> oh, and yes, someone just commented. Yeah, Gabby was my first um, on-page demisexual, asexual spectrum um, here when, and that was like really great to be able to write that too. I loved, I loved exploring how she opened up to him about that and how open he was too. So, yeah. Will all of your books moving forward have some sort of chronic illness or disability rep in them? And can you disclose what chronic illnesses or disability rep you will have? Um, So I can say right now that Get, get my directions right. There it is. Two wrongs make a right. <laughs> That's my mm-hmm. debut traditional and traditional publishing with Berkeley. And that has um, autism and anxiety, like um, long-term, like lifelong anxiety rep. Um, so I can't share what's in the rest of the series, but it's going to be there. Um, and I will share as soon as I can. But yeah. And then in terms of the next Berkman book, I can't tell you that either yet, but I'm excited <laughs> about it. Some of it's new. I figured. What's that? 
I said, I figured it was probably. Yeah, I know. I'm always like, a dream. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually still working on finding an authenticity source for the Bergman book. So that's subject to change. And that's always part of why I don't want to like commit because it's like, oh, if it doesn't work out. I don't know anyone with this condition, but I think it'd be really cool to explore. So if you need a POTS or celiac or oh green my pets, gosh. I actually would love to talk to you about POTS. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I have celiac. So I'm like, well, I don't know. Twins. <laughs> Twins. I never yeah. see celiac. That's one thing I wish. I've never read one with celiac. Which yeah, sucks. that's that's going to happen at some point. I'll tell that because that's I live with that nonsense and I'm tired. <laughs> nonsense. time to rate about it. Time to be <laughs> mad about it. Yes. <laughs> so since we're on the subject, um, what steps do you take to make sure that the representation in your books are as accurate and sensitive as possible? Yeah, that's, um, I have a really solid system in place. Now I did it in all ways. Um, and I've learned a lot about that, like to the point that, and I think everyone here knows, but just for anyone else listening, like I reworked um, certain aspects of my first book in the Bergman's because I got, I'd heard from some people who had, um, well, there's a spoiler, some people who had this condition, um, <laughs> That they were like, I really relate to this. Other people were like, I feel like there's some inaccuracies. And so I was like, okay, I have an, I made friends with an author through the book who liked it, who has the condition. And she was like, well, I'd love to work with you. Like these inaccuracies didn't bother me, but I can see why they did for other people. And I'd love to help you make it more accurate. So anyway, what um, I'd been doing at that point, but what I did with her and what I do for all my books now is before I write this story, I... I'm either friends with or I live with or I locate an authenticity source. I talk with them and interview them about the condition. Um, I have like questions lined up, but then I also open it up to them and I basically say, hey, if you saw yourself in an open door romance novel, what would be really important to you to see? Recognizing, of course, that no one person is going to ever represent the totality of an experience, a condition, a disability, a disease that's okay, you know, but that's what working with this person to be as authentic to their experience. I always try to find someone else who has it too, who can just kind of give me like a general sensitivity feedback. Sometimes that's possible. Sometimes it's not, but I count on my broader sensitivity readers to kind of come in because a lot of them have chronic conditions or yeah, all of them do. <laughs> but anyway, so I interview them, I get all that from them. Then I write. I think it's so important to start off before I've written the character to start off with that perspective to really guide the character. So then I'm not trying to shoehorn parts in to something I'm picturing, but I'm really letting what I know personally, which is that these chronic conditions are fundamental parts of who you are. So trying to let that be a fundamental part of how I shape the character. Um, I write the book, then I send it to the authenticity readers. They give me their honest feedback. Um, if there's anything I'm not like sure about what they meant or I wanna dig into it more, we either chat on Zoom or we email or we Google Doc talk and comments mm -hmm. and make those changes. And then they review that again to make sure I interpreted what they said in a way that like lands right with them. And then it's pretty traditional at that point. It goes to further sensitivity reading than my editor and proofreader. Um, but yeah, it's, I basically just have tried to do everything that I would hope to hear someone had done who's writing outside of their lived experience that's mine. Um, and some people just aren't going to be cool with that. They're just going to be like, I don't want to read rep by somebody who's not living that. And that is completely valid for them. And I respect that. But that's why I always try to credit folks to talk about, I've involved people from your community. So at least people feel like it's a safe space to try to enter into if they're open to it. Um, but I'm just in general, just really passionate about trying to do my best to involve the community, represent the community I'm writing the character from and show that this matters to take that care and to take that time and to let the community as much as possible speak into the character if they're not writing from the community themselves, you know? And I, I was long sorry. <laughs> no, you're, I know. That was when, great. And I remember I was in your reader group when you announced you were reworking the first book. And yeah. I don't have the condition that's in the first book, but I just respected you like so much for being open about that and just saying, hey, there were some things I can rework, you know, to better respect that community. And yeah. I think it's something that a lot of authors should like take note of is it's okay to make those mistakes, but you know, yeah. you were so open about it. And I just loved that so much. Thanks. I mean, again, like I have read terrible rap of, in my opinion, of some conditions I live with and I, it's just, it's really hurtful. And even though like I tell myself they probably didn't mean to, it's like, 
but I would assume enough people are telling them that this is hurtful or this is upsetting. There are many ways I know to get in touch with an author to let them know how you feel. So like I can't imagine they don't know. And so actually for me, what hurts more is, and this is why I took this so seriously. It's like the ongoing, I don't care. It's a book, it's fiction, deal with it. You know, like, you know, I wanted to demonstrate the good faith of this was never on my intent, but I think it's so important. And maybe this is like the fact that I grew up my dad's an academic and he's just like, your ego has nothing to do with it. It's either well done, it's well researched, it has integrity or it's crap and you have to do it all over again. <laughs> like that's the household I was raised. And then I went into literary criticism for my undergrad. So like criticism and being given harsh, honest feedback is to me the heart and backbone of good, any kind of representational or artistic effort. So for me, it was just like, okay, uh, course I want to be open so everyone can know I didn't mean to do this thing but man it happened and now let's fix it um and I just think just to show people like if they happen to stumble on the later version just be like oh okay even though this rep might not totally resonate with me as a person with this condition they've done anything I could ask someone to try to do and it's going to be someone's condition and their their experience of it mm -hmm. I just saw a comment someone saying would I write a character with CP in a wheelchair um I I'm open to it. You know, I, I have my eye on some of those things, but again, like I'm always trying to toe this line of, I don't know why some conditions feel like closer to my own lived experience or those of whom I love that I'm like, okay, I feel like this is a lane I'm comfortable stepping into and involving an authenticity source and reader and others that I'm just like, man, I really just want to uplift folks who are writing and living this perspective. So there are just some of those conditions and experiences and identities that I'm just like, I really just want to exclusively elevate. Um, so it's sort of hard to know. Sometimes I get to a condition that I thought before, I don't think I'm going to go there. And I go there and others, I'm like, nah, let's just keep uplifting. So um, I want to see books with characters with CP and wheelchairs. We yes. need more of them. And if I don't, I can promise you anybody who's writing them, I will be uplifting them. There's one coming out and I'm going to blank on the name. It's a YA. Um, do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's um, it's like play with your heartstrings or something. It's, um, oh, Is I'm it blanking. Pink I'm cover? Is it pink? It's blue and it, they're, they're in like a subway train and one of them has like an upright a violin, but the author has CP, I believe. And it's like, even like the representation of like how her hand is impacted by it. It's very clear on the cover. Like it's so cool and beautiful. Hmm. Google YA cerebral palsy romance and it will come up. I'm so sorry. I'm so terrible with names. Ah, but yeah. I know. Unfortunately, I don't read as much YA, but and I feel like YA tends to have a little bit more representation. That's why I so appreciate that yeah. you write adult romance, adult open door romance with that representation. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's that's something that I mean, especially when it comes to like physical stuff. I know I think we're just like, oh, well, those things don't go together, like sexiness and like bodily functions or bodily struggles. And it's like, actually, 40 percent of Americans <laughs> have a chronic condition. So it is, you know, big time. And we need to stop like desexualizing people who do feel sexual. And of course, there are those who don't. And that's valid. But those who do, they need to see themselves represented as well. So, yeah. That matters to me a lot. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned talking, like doing research and talking to people before you start writing the character. So mm -hmm. what is your writing process? What, like start to finish, what is your writing process? Um, it's once the characters have me in their clutches and their voice feels very clear and I've talked with my authenticity sources, um, I'm just, I just go. Usually I no every time I picture the opening chapter very clearly. Like like I literally felt like I was like almost falling asleep one night and I like saw exactly how with you forever started. I was like, "Oh yeah, Rooney's in the car. It's like autumn and it's glory in the Pacific Northwest and the wind's whipping her beautiful hair and Keisha's <laughs> blasting like I was just like sat up and started writing. I have never rewritten like in terms of fundamentals a first chapter in the Bergmans. Every time what I've pictured, it's gotten wordsmith, but that's how it is. Oh, some, there you go. Thank you. It's You, Me, and Our Heartstrings by Melissa C. That's the CP rep. Okay, sorry. But yeah, so <laughs> once I get the opening chapter, like once that's vivid in my mind, once I feel like the voice of the character is clear, I just start. Um, I usually have a big 
jumbled playlist that has like the vibes <laughs> kind of. And sometimes those are songs that I don't end up feeling work well with the previous book and I kind of dump into it. And then I sift through and I'll start a scramble and then I'll start to hear songs and be like, oh, I think this goes in this part of the story. Or sometimes I'm like, this is exactly for this chapter. So I use music a lot. And um, yeah, I just kind of picture very vividly. I feel like the voice is very clear of the character. And I'm just always asking myself, why? Why are they here? Why are they in this moment with this person? Why are these two people together? Like, I think just thinking fundamentally constantly about motivation and reason really helps the plot feel character motivated, but then also feel like who the characters are is tied with a plot that's hopefully engaging too. And then, yeah, I just, sometimes I have to pause, like if I can't picture what's next or if I'm kind of questioning if I took the right turn, I'll pause. Um, I generally don't read anything else because I kind of just want to stay in my world. Then mm -hmm. I dive back into it when I'm feeling it again and just like gook, 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 kind of junk, 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 the train my way down the track. And then at some point it's done. <laughs> try to put it away and get it to my, my readers and get feedback and then work on it again and just wordsmith it, tweak any rep or plot points that don't work and just kind of keep doing that until I'm ready to let it go to my editor. Yeah. As your writing process, is it different when you were writing like your indie books versus your writing process with your traditionally published book? Is it any different? No, um, not, not really, honestly, because, well, sometimes I've been sending it to my editor, Christine at Berkeley, at the same time I send it to my authenticity readers and like, then I'll loop her in when she gives me developmental edits back. So if there's anything like that they are... Um, giving me feedback on the, like about rep, I'll just like note like this was authenticity feedback because basically how it works is when I turn it into my editor, um, that's when she's going to give me any like feedback pretty much just about how I created the story itself. Like, does she like where it's landing? Does she feel good about its direction? Are there any aspects she wants me to reframe or address or she thinks might be insensitive? But she really like respects my craft and my process. She knows about it. So yeah, and so it just depends on the timing and how soon I finish the book before I send it to her. But either way, it's still getting to the authenticity readers. And then I have to work and track changes and I send it back to her so she can see everything that's done. And then she kind of just goes through and like okays it and then she turns it in for copy edits. And then what you get from any traditional publisher is the manuscript that's been copy edited. And it's kind of wild because what the authors get is called past pages and that's the copy edited manuscript. And like you'll catch things they can't change it. It's like arcs already. You're like, ah. So it's a little bit like terrifying because you put a lot of pressure on yourself when you turn that thing into your editor for copy. And it's, it's like, that to me is when I, as an indie author, I'm like, okay, it's ready for arcs. Like it's been proofread at that point, but I just proofread it later again and always catch something. So no, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty similar. Like all of the same processes involved. It's just stretched out with traditional publishing mm -hmm. with lots of leeway time. Mm -hmm. Other than rep, what do you find is the hardest part of writing? Oh, uh, <laughs> there's so many things. Like, <laughs> um, I doubt myself in ways, like the whole time, like when you're so close to it, I kind of feel like writing's happening to me. And sometimes I like, you know how you, any person has self-doubt about choices they're making or like identity or self-worth. Like, I think I just am sometimes like, what? why am I doing this again? Like I, or is this okay? Or, you know, just there's sort of these like weird moments of, of imposter syndrome, maybe. Um, also like sometimes the content itself is very personal. It just like taps into something that's really emotional for me. So I'll feel kind of lonely in that because I'm not sharing it with anyone else yet. So I just kind of have to sit there and feel my feelings, <laughs> which as mm -hmm. Gavin and everything forever says, this feeling, my feeling shit is shit. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> <laughs> how I often feel about feelings. I don't like them. Um, so it makes me feel a lot. And yeah, I um, I think the final thing is, is that I know and respect the need for the death of the author when you surrender the book. But I think because I write so personally about things that I often relate to or that come from people I love, you know, when you catch the occasional review, they get tagged in that you wish you hadn't been tagged in and you just feel really misunderstood or disappointed. Um, it kind of just like stings. I've gotten better over the years at just like letting it roll and that's their truth and that's okay. I have my like, 
address. <laughs> like, <Wolf. laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, there's just, there's just these little moments throughout that feel kind of lonely and vulnerable. And but it's in general a great joy for me to write. It's a great joy so for actually, us to read. Speaking, oh, exactly. <laughs> speaking of being tagged in reviews, which, by the way, to anyone watching who does reviews, do not tag authors in reviews that are less than five stars. Just saying. Or but they how can do you say anything critical? Like, you, just yes. If you wouldn't like, just if you wouldn't it. tap me on the shoulder and be like, "I love your outfit," full stop. If you'd go, well, right. actually, I think like that shirt isn't like. I think you could have worn a different color and like, it's fine that you didn't, but like you could right. look better in that color and like your pants are okay, but like right. they could be a little bit shorter and you could probably use a haircut, like, but it was, your, your outfit's generally great. Like anything that's not <laughs> like, <laughs> nice, just leave it. it. Cause that's, that's tagging the author to see a compliment, not the review, right? Like that's just for them to right. know you adored it, but anything mm -hmm. else, just right. please. Only Let me be gushing in <laughs> I know. Yes. And be actually that was going to be my question was like, like how, how do you feel? Actually, how do you feel about being tagged in any reviews? Because I know there are some authors who just don't want to be tagged at all, even if it's gushing. But how do you feel about strictly gushing reviews or being tagged and at like, all? And maybe, maybe I'm sounding egoic saying this, and like I really don't see it that way. Like it, to me, it's it's about a relationship. Like I want to, like I keep my DMs accessible. I'm okay with being tagged in positive reviews because basically what I'm looking for is to like connect with you positively over the aspect of the story like i want us to like okay you felt seen in the representation or this was really moving to you or this taught you something like i would love to connect with you about that like that is part of why i write is so that people who don't often get to feel seen in romance feel seen in romance and the messages those emails those dms they mean the world to me. Like I don't cry, but I cry when I read those. <laughs> like Aww. my friends sometimes who have the condition of like this DM and I won't like say who, I won't say all of it, but just the part they're like, oh my God, Chloe. Like I live for that. So I'm okay with that. You know, I just, I really do. I have days and almost all of my author friends I know do this where you just like make yourself a drink and you're feeling masochistic and you look at the two star Goodreads reviews and you look up your hashtag and you look for the eviscerating oh, no. words and you just laugh and cry and you like maybe take a couple notes you know but we know and like there's so many ways to get critical feedback but yeah i so i'm personally okay with being tagged in it if like you kind of want to connect with me over like a positive aspect of the story but other than that please no thank no thank you please <laughs> <laughs> mother would say um, yeah don't so say Speaking of social media, as an indie author, do you feel pressure to like be super involved in social media or is, an as is it an aspect that you love of this job? Like what is your opinion on social media? Well, I definitely feel like I have to do it. I mean, when you're indie, like your appearance, like your, your platform, your social media page is like often what people go to to kind of see like, do they have it together or are they just like someone writing on their page? <laughs> <laughs> you know so you have to like sell your whole self in a way as like something legitimate um and i i feel like i used to share a little bit more personally and i just got really burned out on that because it's really vulnerable and i think i'm being really vulnerable in my writing so i kind of get to social media and i'm like oh my god i just poured it all to that last book like here's some books i loved i hope you have a great monday drink some coffee bye like i just don't <laughs> have anything anymore um but when i do i try to share it so i do feel like it's necessary and i'm very grateful to like have the platform that i do at this point like i love uplifting authors and doing giveaways and like trying to connect my readers with these folks so I, I see its value and um, I've just let myself slow down on how much I post and just try to like be authentic. But like when I do share something like mean it, just don't, I when I went like two weeks, like last month, I was just like, I have nothing to say. This would just be empty for these folks. I'm not going to do it. So yeah, I, I see it's worth the necessity, but I've also like gotten better at having kind of boundaries and taking it easier on myself. Looking at the comments, um, I'm a big mood reader. I find myself switching up genre tropes based on moods. Do you ever feel your writing mood changing? Mm, yeah, um, I think I've actually kind of, that's something I'm sort of aware of though and like trying to cultivate a pretty consistent tone. Like 
I, w- I don't ever want someone to be like caught off guard by like, oh, sh- Chloe, this was a really depressing book. Like, I, <laughs> I, I think like in terms of the Bergmans, like I have a tenor, right? Like, you know, you're going to get some laughs, you know, you're going to get, you're going to want to throw your e-reader or book at the wall because I like do that thing where you think they're going to do it and then they don't, you know, <laughs> and then there's going to be some in some emotion moments and some feelings like so I kind of want to create consistency in that story world and that's for the safety of my readers like I'm very sensitive to how heavy things can be like it can really affect me and I really just like to kind of know that I can count on certain series or worlds to be consistent so I do hold myself to that standard within the Bergmans and if I ever just feel like I really can't write that way then that's when I know I'm generally burned out and I need to just like read and rest um because that's the kind of story i like to read mostly um occasionally i like to hurt and be sad or get scared but generally i just want to like laugh a little bit swoon feel frustrated feel my feelings and um no happy happy happily ever after is coming so yeah yeah well this is one of the few series that every like each time i finished each book i just felt so like warm on the inside like each book just left a warm feeling. Like I felt like an honorary Bergman. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad. You know, when I do think about the one book that definitely has the heavier emotional tenor, but there was just, believe it or not, I tried to make it as light as possible is the third book because it's a marriage in crisis. Mm-hmm. And like, yep. there's just no making that fun. Um, so I was like, okay, how do I infuse as much like humor and levity through the really hard, like first 40% of this, because I knew like the joy was coming and the, and the, and hopefully the big payoff of them reconciling was just going to be that much more wonderfully intense for having how intense it was at the beginning. But yeah, that was why I was like, okay, let's really try to infuse as much joy as we can. But it's, um, sometimes just the tropes and the characters themselves are only going to let you go so light. So that's definitely one that I can acknowledge definitely went a little a little heavier but ended on such a happy note i love that last chapter it's like yes we're all dancing around and oliver or is it vigo who like sprinkles confetti (laughs) (laughs) i think that book actually has another one of my favorite scenes too because pretty much all the scenes when they are in marriage counseling but there is a conversation that they had about the the um fallacy or the like how it's not oh, yeah. true that a marriage is equal and mm-hmm. that it's it's ableist to think that a marriage is equal and I just like that hit me so hard as someone who has multiple sclerosis fair. and feeling that yeah yeah it's like it's not it, fair it doesn't to happen. exactly it's fair right <laughs> yeah right I actually remember talking that was with like my about. aha moment <laughs> yeah <laughs> because that is the thing and I actually had someone reach out to me recently and say that like they really appreciated like the interabled um couple them in the series and i think that's like that is something i'm really trying to show throughout because oh man that that line culturally of like oh the the abled partner is like being like taking care of their partner as a charity case or like what a saint they are it's like ew like that is so wrong um nina tame um she i forget her handle she's um british she's a wheelchair user and she talks about this a ton on instagram and i just really really love how she highlights like the joy and the uniqueness of her partnership um and just really really debunks that absolute garbage because it is garbage (laughs) Mm -hmm. absolutely um someone asked autism is very personal for me how do you come with characters on the spectrum i'm on the spectrum so I relate to and know a lot of people on the spectrum. So it's not hard to write about the people I love and about the multitudes within myself because definitely since I learned, um, and this was only, oh gosh, I don't know how many years ago, but less than five that I've known that I'm on the spectrum. You know, I've, I've, I've learned and unlearned things about myself. And I feel like as I've gone through the journey of writing characters on the spectrum, um, I can see parts of my journey of unmasking and healing and learning new parts of myself in how I explored their experiences. So, and there's still just so much that I haven't even touched into that I'm really excited to in the future about the ways that one can experience autism and, and live. And um, yeah, there's, there's profound nuance in it. So yeah, I want to dig into that. 
So would you say the marriage and trouble trope was the most difficult to write since it was the heaviest? What has been the most fun trope to write and what has been the most difficult trope to write? Um, there was something deeply fun about Ren and Frankie because it was my first friends to lovers that I'd written. And at first I was like, where the heck's the conflict? They're just <laughs> nice to each other all the time. What is this crap? But then I was like, wait, <laughs> the conflict is within. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can do this. Um, but yeah, I really had like a crisis. I was like, what do you do when they're just not jerks to each other or misunderstanding <laughs> each other? Why aren't they just together? Page 80, happily ever after the end. <laughs> so, but once I just like stopped worrying about that and just like let them be, I just had a blast writing um, Ren and Frankie. But it was also my first um, like openly autistic character and it was really, really vulnerable emotionally to write and scary, but it was really cool. And that was my first Publishers Weekly reviewed book and it got a starred review and it was amazing. I remember bawling my eyes out and I emailed Helen Huang and I was like, it took me a year and a half to find my courage and be like, thank you for writing the Kiss Quotient. I realized I was autistic because I read the Kiss Quotient. And oh I just God. finally had the courage to write a book about that. And she was like, well, you should send it to me and I'll blurb it. And I was like, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? <laughs> so that was incredible. Like just the vulnerability of Helen's book, the vulnerability I felt safe to have in my book that helped me connect with her. And now she's like a friend to me, like an incredibly generous, kind person who's been so supportive of me and my work, like was all in that book that was just a lot of fun and also deeply vulnerable. Um, so that was like my easiest trope and book to write in some ways. And yeah, I think emotionally the marriage in crisis was hardest because I really just wanted to honor the pain and the struggle, but also the hope that's um, in that. And like, that's the dedication in the book is something along the lines of like to those who've been to hell, to those who've lost hope and those who've gone to hell and back to find it. And that's an allusion to the Orpheus and Eurydice story, which is woven throughout. And I really was like, okay, well, guess we got to go to hell before we can come back. What have I done? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's really tough to like stick to what I knew I needed to do um, and, and stay in those places. But it was also, I knew it wasn't going to be my widest read book. I knew there people were going to be like, I don't read that trope. But hearing from the people who've reached out to me, whose marriages have had, been in a tough place and who've, who have felt seen kind of in the ways you were talking about, Brie, that's worth it to me every time. Because I've gone through that season and been reading romances and I'm like, I feel so lonely. You know, there's just so little romance that really digs into that that moment in a lot of people's lives. So that was mm -hmm. difficult, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you did it too. Because I had, when I read that book, I had only found out my diagnosis not too long, mm -hmm. like months earlier. And I remember, because, you know, I'm married, and I just remember mm -hmm. thinking, like, how scary the future was for my mm -hmm. husband, for my children, and worrying so much about it not being equal. And then I read that line, and I was like, I feel better now. <laughs> like it kind of just, I, cause I didn't think about it in that way. And so yeah. I just, I'm so glad that you read that book. Yeah. Um, so your next book, Two Wrongs Make a Right is based on Much Ado About Nothing. It's a retelling. Do you have, what can you tell us about that book? And also do you have any other retellings that you would want to do? Yes. Um, so yeah, Two Wrongs Make a Right is, I've actually, and I know this just isn't going to like fly for some people and that's fine because I'm me and I like to do this to myself. This really is like a reimagining. Like it isn't a retelling and like I'm not following the plot beat for beat. I am being a giant Shakespeare dork and like digging into the <laughs> themes a lot. <laughs> like I worked hard on this. Like you should see my notes in my Much Ado About Nothing and like my whole like <laughs> I had like an academic thesis proposal <laughs> written down for this. But basically, yeah. Uh, you know, in the play Much Ado, Benedict, this guy, and Beatrice are declared bachelors and spinster. Like they just, they want nothing to do with the institution. And um, they also just bicker. They do not get along at all. And they have some of the greatest banter ever. Um, and then their friends are like at a masquerade party and they're like kind of drunk and punchy on love. And they're like, let's set them up a mountain of affection and let's play Cupid, build a mountain of affection and trick them into falling in love. And um, that's like cute in Shakespeare, but in real modern life, that's like a terrible thing to do to people. So I was like, well, what <laughs> if they found out this had been done to them and they were very upset about it because they would be very upset. And thus is born a fake dating for revenge. Opposites attract 
starchy, stern brunch daddy, cat daddy, <laughs> glasses wearing, <laughs> pediatrician, and a, a chaotic, autistic, look at her beautiful tats, erotic artist who decide that they're going to fake date and then break up so spectacularly. It just wrecks everyone. Um, but then they fall in love. And yeah, so I made some really cool choices, I think, based on the play that anybody who's a nerd for the play will like. And if you're not, that's cool. I just tried to make it like a feel good, affirming book. It's probably my happiest, not fluffiest, but like kind of warmest, happiest book. It was written in pandemic. Is anyone surprised? This was born. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is coming out November 22nd. Yay, and um, yeah, the next two books in the series are also going to be Shakespeare retellings, which I can't tell you what they are, but <laughs> the finished copy of this digital and print is going to have the first chapter of the second book. <gasps> and I love it. <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's so good. Um, yeah, and it's a sisters trilogy, like the Brown sisters. We've got three sisters and they each get a book. Yay. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. I love sisters books. I have two sisters, so I'm so drawn to books like that. I love the Brown mm -hmm. sisters series too. Yeah, and like I I really like to, and I know this doesn't float everyone's boat, but like anybody who's read the Bergmans knows to expect this from me right now. Like I really like to play with intent and like, that fine line between like love and like sticking your nose in someone's business when you should not, because that's right. what real people do. Um, you know, so I've seen some people who are like, these secondary characters are not respecting their 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 choices. And I'm like, do, you, do any of your friends respect <laughs> all of your choices or family? <laughs> who do you live with? Who do you hang out with? I, I, I thought this was normal. Am I, whoops, you know, like. I it just, is very normal. <laughs> yeah, like so I'm definitely playing with that. And that and that's the way that this sort of departs from much ado, right? Is like in much ado, they're like just denial, 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 and then they get tricked into falling in love. But with these, like mm -hmm. they have to make a choice to be on the same side. You know, they really have to kind of jump that line between dislike and not getting along and not at all having things in common and being like, well, we're gonna choose to be on the same side, you know? So I just, I liked how having the people who love them, but messed it up a bit, um, being what pro, like kind of compels them to take a leap they otherwise wouldn't. And that's the irony, right? They set out to punish the people who set them up and then they end up discovering that maybe their friends were a little bit right, but they just went the really wrong <laughs> way about it. You know? I, like, I like digging into that complexity. So that's that's gonna happen among the sisters too. They're gonna they're going to overstep or get it wrong, but they're going to love each other and forgive and grow. So I like meddling around with that. It reminds me of oh the gosh, brother so from um, <laughs> everything for you. Ego. How meddlesome how metal he was. Why is Ego. he in your house? You know which scene I'm talking about. Like, why is he in your yeah. house? Vigo <laughs> was like, and I talk about him like he like he's his own thing doing this to me, but I'm telling you what. That man shows up in my brain when I'm writing. He's like, chaos I'm like, we go, no, don't do it. He's like, we must, Chloe, we must. I'm like, oh my God, this is getting worse and worse. He's like punishing like me for not giving you his book quite yet. You know, he's just like every book. He's like, it's okay, it's not my book yet. Well, I'm just going to show up even more. Right. Be just be chaotic and terrible. I'm like so he, was, he was hilarious. He was hilarious. Like I laughed every time he came on page, and I was like, "Good gosh!" I said, "What is this menace about to do?" I know. <laughs> <a menace. laughs> and he was unapologetic <laughs> about it, which he should be, because that's how yeah. siblings are. He's never sorry, like <laughs> ever. <laughs> that's. But everybody loves him. They're. I'm like you guys. You're complaining about these like side characters not totally respecting boundaries. And there's Vigo who's like a Mack truck, just like black <laughs> everyone over. Like, oh, that's him. He's the best. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you do. <laughs> okay, I'm going back in the comments a little bit. Um, talking about how romance can connect us all through things like this. So how did you get into romance? And do you remember the first romance that you read? This yeah, it's a romance. Okay. This should not have been in my <laughs> in my middle and high school library. Daughter of the Forest is <laughs> like an Irish folklore retelling. That was steamy. And 
I just stumbled onto it. I was like 13 and I was like, Oh, all right. Okay. I'm here. Um, and I, so for a while, cause I'd been into historical fiction. Like I loved that, like, um, Karen Cushman books. And like, I just loved anything that was like girls and young folks, like kind of wrestling through difficult times in the past. And then, so I just got into like fantasy, but then I didn't read romance for a lot of years because I was just reading everything else for all my studies. And then I circled back into a historical romance and I don't remember who it was. Um, and it was just cute. It was fine. And then I kind of got away from it for a couple of years. And I, I really dove into like indie romance and in KU. And that's when I was like in Kindle Unlimited. And I was like, okay, I'm not seeing the things I want. Like she's orgasming after three penetrative thrusts mm -hmm. and nothing else. And if one more person has a Barbie body and another person has like $8 billion, I'm going to break something. <laughs> so I was just really tired of that. I'm like, listen, that's fun. It's entertaining. I'm not yucking anyone's yum. Like I just got tired of not finding um, the kind of stuff about people I loved and myself. And I was like, I just want to like close that like proximity gap a little bit and feel more of reality affirm mm -hmm. my romance. So mm -hmm. then, yeah, I just decided I would write it. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I know you mentioned, er sorry, go ahead. No, I just go ahead. I know you mentioned earlier that you um, take a break from reading when you're in the like when you're in the middle of, of writing. Do you find it hard to read romance sometimes while you're writing? Like just as a romance writer, like obviously you love the genre, but is it sometimes hard to read the same genre? Yeah, it is. Um, it is. Yeah, I I really can't read it like when I'm in the middle because number one, I always worry. I'm like, what if I subconsciously bleed right. something in? I don't want to do that. Um, but it's also like, it, um, it's kind of like if you had to randomly stay in a hotel, like you had to leave your house. If there's like, I don't know, the electricity went out and you just go and stay somewhere randomly for a night. You're like, this just is not right. <laughs> you know, it's like reading <laughs> something else when I'm in the middle of building a world, I can't really immerse myself. So I'll sometimes find that if I'm like really in a rut with my writing project, I can, I can squeak in like a historical romance because it feels so different. Um, mm -hmm. But often I'll read like thrillers or I'll kind of flip through my previous books and just kind of look for that joy, that spark. Sometimes I'll kind of look at the beat and like percentage point that I was in previous books and see what did I do here? How did I shift directions? Sometimes it just kind of like unlocks. I never recreate anything, but it'll help me remember like, oh, that's when I, oh, okay. And it just kind of gets me believing in myself maybe again and, and remembering how I, I problem solved. So yeah, I, I, I just find in general too that I have to take breaks from contemporary romance because I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the mechanics so much and the craft and we're all going to do things differently. And some folks approach really works for me and some folks it doesn't. And I want to try to find ways to appreciate different approaches, but I just need to be like distanced from my own craft before I can try to do that. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Victoria said she loves seeing the Swedish culture in the Bergman's family. Thank you, Denise. I'm going to forget her handle. Maybe it's rambling out loud. I forget. She is wonderful. And um, I pay her in book, de book depository books. I'm like, Denise, can you tell me about these holidays? And is this word correct? And uh, what do you think about in this moment? She's like always happy to answer those questions. And I'm like, okay, Denise, what's on the wish list on book depository? <laughs> you don't have to do that every time. I'm like, I'm going to do it, Denise. So tell me what book you want. <laughs> So it's fun. I like pop onto Instagram, but she did actually email me a while ago with like a whole list of things to do around the different holidays through the year. So I'm actually excited to weave that in. I've wanted to do it more, but every time with the books, it just hasn't quite landed yet. I'm hoping with the last two to um, work that in, but I'm also developing some bonus content for various reasons in the future. And so maybe that's when the holiday stuff will get woven in. So even more Swedish culture is coming. Yay. <laughs> Do you have any plans for what's happening after the Bergmans, like other than your traditionally published series? Well, it's sort of tricky because technically how it works is like my next project after I um, finish the third book for Barkley will be like you propose your option to your editor like they get first dibs. So I'm actually 
meeting with my agent in a couple of days because I have some ideas and I wanted to talk to her because she's so amazing and strategic. So I kind of have a couple of different directions I could go. But that said, I foresee not leaving the Bergman world. Um, I Let's just say that I thought deeply about certain babies that were born and introduced I was ask that. in a certain Yay. book recently. And if I would like writing them as leads one day when they are not children anymore. Yay. <laughs> yeah. 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 That makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Victoria said, my mom is Swedish, so we celebrate the same holidays. Mm. I love seeing them in both. Oh. Yeah. They'll be coming then. You'll see them. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question kind of unrelated to anything. Just your covers are so cute. Thank you. So how did you decide that you wanted to go like the kind of animated route? Because I love these. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to do something I hadn't really seen like before and I'm not saying my books are super, super original. Like there's a kajillion million illustrated covers, but I liked the idea of every time the Bergman sibling being in the foreground and their love interest being in the background. Um, and I knew I had seven siblings and there's seven colors in a, in a certain thing called the rainbow. So I was like, well, so now we know what the last two colors of the, the last two people are going to be. Um, so I was like, well, this is super fun. Let's do like a rainbow theme and let's find like complementary colors. And I just, my friend Jenny, who was my authenticity source for Rooney, she has ulcerative colitis. And when she and I first met, we bonded over me having celiac and a lot of residual intestinal damage. She has ulcerative colitis and she's also gluten intolerant. So she's my sick tummy buddy. Um, and she is a very talented graphic um, designer, but she doesn't do a lot of like, she wasn't doing a lot of freelance at the time, but I was like, Jenny, you want to do my books? <laughs> and she's like, okay. Um, so basically what I would do is kind of give her a physical description and a Pinterest board. And she's always, always happy to receive those Pinterest boards because <laughs> I find very beautiful people and just have like a blast and just build these big boards. And then I kind of tell her the colors that I'm feeling. And she came up with, um, using like the kind of this making the text so big and that's what I, I think is kind of different and fun is that the text is really it's an important part of the cover um and i i like that because my titles have a lot of meaning they're always in the books okay. and um they're always parts of really important moments in the story so i like foregrounding the text and making it so that there's enough illustration hopefully that you can kind of like feel the character but not so specific that you're like i can't picture them myself and i think when i told jenny that i think she interpreted that really well she gave you enough detail that they're like faces but not so much that it's intrusive um yeah and i feel like every time she does it like faster and gets it right away like oliver's and gavin's book it was like the first time she sent it to me i was like uh, uh, that's it what the <laughs> heck did you just like <laughs> Take that from my brain and <laughs> slap it on a book. Um, so every time we're like getting more mind melded, it's really cool. And I just love working with my friend. So, yeah. So I have a question. Are those Pinterest boards public? <laughs> I would love to see that. <laughs> You're a little thirsty, okay? Like, <laughs> even better. Even better. <laughs> Even better, like, let us know. Oh, people ask about them all the time. I'm like, oh, I got to go clean them. <laughs> no, no, no cleaning, no cleaning. No. You guys, okay, I'll work on it. No, yes. no, don't work on it. Give us the raw product. Drop I'm them like, in the comments I, below right now. Where are these pearls that I'm clutching? Like, who do I think I'm getting? <laughs> uh, yes, Chloe, we know you're thirsty. All right, so. Yeah, I'll make them public one day. <clears throat> yeah, they're fun. Because I also like weave within them like the color scheme that I want to. So I kind of start like weaving in abstract images. And um, yeah, the Pinterest board that I had going for this one, because she's an erotic artist, I definitely had to clean that one up. Because I was like, oh, that's great erotic art. Oh, that's great erotic art. <laughs> it's like, I can't send this to Berkeley cover art team. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, we're not there yet. <laughs> But I did say uh, a separate one. 
exactly, Rachel. Give us the real ones. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm all about showing you real until the Pinterest boards get called for. <laughs> I agree with this comment because I remember I had like the first two or three books and I was like, couldn't wait till everything um, for you came out. Cause I was like, I need them all on my shelf. And then I ordered like the last two and I just love staring at them. It's a big, it's like the perfect red. Like I was, I knew I wanted to go for this like saturated vibrant because I didn't want to go pastels because I kind of liked, and I'm not saying if, the, if a book is pastel, it can't have any heavy content, but I kind of liked the idea of like hewing to a level of like intensity of heat and emotions. And um, so I was like, okay, let's just make everything really like vivid and kind of gem tone, like jewel tones. So that just getting that right red that blended well from like from the purple to the red, I was just like, ah. And yeah, I'm really excited for the last two. I get to we stack those too. bad boys up. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Can't wait to see them. All right. Do y'all have any other last questions for Chloe? Yes. Is a polycon, are you excited about attending a signing next year? Yeah, I am. I like, I really loved um, just seeing that there were so many different names from so many different corners of publishing that were attending this year. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I'm in the Pittsburgh area. I'm not in the area. I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm in the city. So it's not that far to go down to DC. Like it's kind of a nice like starting point for me. I tend to um, just one of the things for me with like neurodivergence and anxiety myself is like, okay, what level of away from home and like logistics can I handle? And I've been to DC and I'm familiar. So I was like, this is a good like first step. Um, Cause there's like a couple that I would like to go to, like um, the rare events down the road. I would really love to try to get over to like the UK for one of those. I probably don't have Australia in me yet, but yeah. So I'm kind of like, this is a good first step. And uh, yeah, it seems like it was very well attended. So I'm hoping um, it'll be a good time next year. I know there's one in Pennsylvania. I think it's like Indies Invade Philly or something. So I don't know. How close the pits Well, I don't know. I'm not familiar with like the area, but I know it's in Philadelphia. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the thing. Like, I just haven't had these kinds of things on my red, like on my radar because it's been pandemic and I've just had my head down, like cranking out books. So, you know, I was like, okay, I actually need to like pick my head up out of the sand and like look around and think about these things because it does mean a lot to people to get to meet authors and share that and like have an opportunity to, to sign books and stuff. So, and I try to like really prioritize like online things to make it really accessible for anyone, anywhere, whatever's going on. But I know it's, it's like nice to be in person sometimes too. So yeah, I um, I definitely want to look into more of those things closer around. I saw I your name on the Polycon list and I was like, okay, now I want to go. Like I had no <laughs> desire. To, I mean like a desire, but I'm in Texas. It's a far trip. Oh, that's me. a hike. I'm like, I want to go. Yeah. I was, I was I excited I when I saw your name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, it's also a really cool time of year to go to DC. Like, it's beautiful. That's Cherry around blossom. cherry blossom time. Cherry blossoms. So come yeah. for the, the the romance and the cherry blossoms. Yeah, yeah. I wish. And, I can't and Chloe, go next we're going for Chloe. <laughs> oh, you can't go next year. No, uh, I'm in college. It's like my last semester in April is. College. Yeah, that's that's like the end. You can't leave for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another time. <laughs> we'll make it happen yes um there's one more question in the comments any plans for the bergman parent story yeah i can't tell you what they are but it's happening <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the chloe you're free yes but i won't tell you anything. i'm like a slow burning person um yeah so they're i'm not going to give them a full-length novel i can tell you that right now at least I don't plan to, but who knows what <laughs> Alex and Alexander and Ellen will do. But yeah, I have some fun plans for probably like novella length is what I'm hoping for. But um, they're definitely going to get some stuff in their perspective. <laughs> and I feel like when I think about writing Alex's perspective, it's like Ren meets Vigo with a little bit of Ryder <laughs> twisted in. And then like, <laughs> and then an, an Ollie just total wackadoodle doing this sometimes. Like I, <laughs> I think when I think about the characters, like when someone's asked me, like, are either of the Bergman parents <clears throat> autistic? And it's like, I feel like in a way maybe Ellen is, and I just haven't really delved into who she is as a person. But I think about how 
like these these parents are so real to me like i'm a parent and i think so much about the depth of their relationship and the way they love their kids and it's fun that i see some of the siblings more like in alexander and then i see like i see freya and um axel and like ziggy more in um ellen and so it's just like kind of fun to have them be that real to me so i really am excited to, to rate them some age time and they have a great meet cute as described and only when it's us when they fight over the chess board. <laughs> That's something I gotta write that. <laughs> that needs to just happen in real time. <laughs> well, I can't wait. But thank you so much for joining us. We will wrap it up here because I know we've taken an hour of your time. Thank you um, for having me. This was lovely. Yes. And everybody go check out Chloe's book, Two Wrongs Make a Right. Is that what it's called? Yep. Yes. In November? Let's see. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 Night, night. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that was so